I asked you to use one word to describe God, what word would you pick? One word to describe who you think God is like. Maybe you'd use the word loving. Maybe you'd use the word patient. Maybe you'd use the word distant because you don't know where he is. Maybe you'd use the word harsh. I'm not sure what word you would choose to describe the God that you know. Would you ever consider calling him generous? Did you ever use the word generous? Generous means someone is liberal in sharing or giving something. Is God liberal in giving and sharing? And you might go, no, he's not because I really need better health and he ain't giving it to me. I really need more money and he doesn't seem to be giving it to me. I'm not sure he's so generous, but have you stopped to think that maybe God is more generous than we could possibly imagine, that maybe that moon and the sun is God's and he shares it with us, that the oceans and the mountains are God's and he gives it to us, that plants and animals, that's all God's and he chooses to give it to us that maybe God is the one who created everything, including you and me. And so this brain, good, bad, and ugly, it's his. This mouth, these hands, these eyes, these ears, these feet, they're all his. And he entrusts it to me, and I get to play with what God owns. Have you stopped to think that maybe he's that generous and so generous that he says, you know, the oxygen that you use, you, you get to use it, and you don't even need to trust me or love me. I, I'll allow you to use my natural resources, my wood and my metals and my water and my air, and you don't even need to believe in me. You don't need to honor me. You don't need to be obey me. You get to use all my stuff, and you don't even honor. You don't even care. You don't even love. That's just how generous he is. You see, I tend to think that I'm entitled to oxygen. I, I tend to think that I'm entitled to health. I'm entitled to relationships. I'm entitled to money. I'm entitled to things that I get to have. Instead of seeing, no, maybe God gives me these things, entrusts them to us to use them on his behalf. You, have you ever hung out with a spoiled child? You're like, yeah, I got a house full of them, right? Have you ever hung out with a spoiled child? A spoiled child with a generous parent. A generous parent gives and gives and gives and gives, and a spoiled child takes and takes and takes and takes. And when a spoiled child gets older and just keeps taking, 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 how's the relationship with the parents go? Does taking from a generous parent cause tension, friction, distance between the generous parent and the entitled child? I think so. And so if all this stuff that we have, the earth and the sky and all our money and our bodies, if it's all a gift from God, we're like spoiled children that keep it and we think it's ours. And it causes tension between us and God. It's actually the Bible calls sin. Because we see everything is ours, mine. I'm a stubborn child. Who are you, God? I don't know you. I don't care about you. I do my own thing. The Bible calls that sin. Rebellion. We're a bunch of stubborn kids. And yet he loves us so much that while I'm yet a sinner, while I'm yet a stubborn, rebellious, entitled child, God sent his son Jesus to live and to die and to rise again that I could be forgiven of my sins. And when I realize that I'm a sinner, that I'm a stubborn, rebellious child, and I put my faith in Jesus Christ, I'm welcomed into the family of God, the kingdom of God. And things start to change. He forgives me. He takes away my shame. And he starts to change my mindset. I become different in my mind. And instead of seeing this as my kingdom, I see that he's got an incredible kingdom that I'm now a part of. Rather than seeing my stuff, my relationships, my time, my money as mine, I begin to see he's the king, I'm not. 
He's the owner, the master. I'm the servant. I'm the son, the daughter. He begins to shift my mindset and change me. Oh, just think for a moment if this really is my money, if this really is my brain, if these are really my hands and everything that I do is really mine. What happens when I take a dirt nap? What happens when we die, when we think everything is ours? Then all those things die too. But if he really is the king, and I'm his son or his daughter, and I see everything I have as that which has been entrusted to me by the king, then with the king I live forever with eternal pleasures at his right hand. But that's a shift of mindset, isn't it? So we're talking about what it means to have a kingdom faith. I want to encourage you to open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 25. Open up your electronic copy, paper copy, Matthew chapter 5, and Jesus is going to encourage us through a story to think about the kingdom of God and to think about how we live as a part of the kingdom. Jesus tells this parable, this story, at the end of his life. So he's lived for three or 33 years. He's been hanging out with his disciples for three years plus. And he's been talking about the kingdom of God, and he's been demonstrating the power of the kingdom of God. He gets to the end of his life, and he says to his disciples something fascinating. He says, hey, I'm the king, but i got to die, and I'm going to rise again, and I'm going to go back to God the Father, and I'm going to chill there for a time, and then I'm going to return to earth, and I'm going to make everything right and new. And his disciples are listening to this and going, wait, you say you're the king. Kings don't die. Like, what? Really? You're just going to tell us right now you're going to die? And you say you're the king, but you're going to leave? And you say you're the king and you're going to come back? Like, how is this all going to go down, Jesus? This doesn't make much sense to me. And Jesus is like, I want to tell you a parable. I'm going to tell you a couple parables to describe, to show you, to teach you what this is like, to trust me. And so he opens up Matthew chapter 25 with a parable about ten virgins, it's called. And the point of this parable, this opening parable, is he says, I'm going to go away but I'm not going to be gone forever. I'm going to return, and I'm going to make things right and new, and he wants his disciples to be watchful and to be ready. So if you're a son or daughter of the king today, and you're going to have kingdom faith, Jesus wants us to learn that kingdom faith is expecting the king is going to return at any time. His return is imminent. It can happen whenever or whenever he wants. So if you sit here today and you believe Jesus came to earth, you believe he died and he rose again and ascended back to God the Father, that's orthodox Christianity. If you believe that, do you also believe that just like he left, he's going to come back? And when he comes back, he's going to make everything right and new. I mean, this is our great hope. And living with a kingdom faith is expecting, watching, waiting, thinking, understanding, living as if he will return to make all things right. So Jesus opens up with a parable about being watchful. But then he says in Matthew 25, 14, a parable that we're going to zoom in together on. Matthew 25, 14 says, Again, it, my exit and return to earth, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. The man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I've gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come, share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I've gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. 
Verse 24, then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you're a hard man, harvesting where I have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid, and I went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here it is, what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the banker so that when I return, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And maybe at first glance, you don't see the generosity of the master in this passage. But when you look close, you recognize that none of these servants were entitled to anything. The gold of this master was his. The master was generous, liberally giving and sharing his resources with his servants. And he gives each servant something different. Five bags of gold, two bags of gold, one bag of gold. And you might think, oh, it's kind of cheesy, some chocolate coins in a bag. But in the ancient world, to get a bag of gold, this was worth millions. So for each of the master's servants, they were given millions to the one, millions, two, millions, five millions of dollars. So this isn't some chump change. This is the master being liberal with his generosity. If each bag is millions of dollars, but did you notice in verse 15 how the master decided to give to each servant? It says, the master gave to each according to his ability. So the master's looking at it and going, I got to go on a journey. I have eight bags of gold and three servants. I could just divide the bag of golds up equally and give the same amount to each servant, but that's not what I'm going to do. Instead, I'm going to take an honest look at each servant. This is my gold. I'm going to divide it up in an honest way. This isn't favoritism. This isn't unjust. This is him looking honestly at what is his and giving it to those who could handle what he offered them. And then he went on his journey. And you know, just like when your boss leaves town, like if you go to work tomorrow and you find out your boss is leaving town for a month, you're like, yes, that's awesome. I'm so glad she's going away. And then you realize very quickly, well, if she goes away, she's going to return, right? You never think, oh, she's going away forever. You always think she's going to go away, but she's going to return. And when my boss returns, I will give an account to her about what I did while she was gone. And so these servants knew in their minds that they were given these bags of gold, but that their master was going to return. The first two servants took the master's gold and doubled the master's gold, and it made the master happy. He says, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. Do you see that generosity? This isn't the master going, this is my gold and I just want it all for me, me, me. This is the master saying, I'm entrusting you with my gold, my stuff, and I want you to do something with it and I want to share everything I have with you. The generous master wants to share his happiness with his servants. First two servants knew this and gladly invested the gold to ensure their long-term happiness and the goodness of their master. But that's not the third servant. That's not how he sees things. He took the gold and trusted to him and did nothing with it. You know that guy at work that when the boss leaves, they're always messing around? You know, we all have been there. They're like taking long lunch breaks, spending all their time on Facebook. You know, they're doing everything that they shouldn't be doing. But as soon as they know the boss comes back, then they're looking like the best worker in the place, right? They're looking spiffy and good, and look at all I've done. And in reality, what are they? They're lazy, 
servants. That's what happens with the third servant. Master, he says in verse 24, I knew you were a hard man, harvesting where you're not sown, gathering where you're not scattered. So I was afraid. I went out and hid your gold in the ground. So here's what belongs to you. Here you go. And his master replied, you're fired. I guess what the master says, you wicked, lazy servant. And he takes the job, the gold from this servant and says, get out. Get out, you wicked and lazy servant. And he tosses him outside. And he describes Jesus being outside as weeping and gnashing of teeth. You see, instead of being faithful, what was entrusted to him, he was fearful. Instead of being faithful, he was fearful, and it cost him everything. And Jesus tells this story to disciples, to people who have put their trust in him, to teach them, to warn them, to show them how to live while he is gone, the God's sons and daughters will give an account to King Jesus upon his return. That just like he left, he will return. And God has entrusted so much to us as sons and daughters. He's given us time. He's given us resources. He's given every one of us a kingdom assignment, a place in this world for us to leverage our abilities and our love and our grace and our truth in a circle of sphere of influence. He's given us so much. He's also entrusted each one of us with money, with dollars and cents and stocks and 401ks and material possessions, all the things we have. He's given all of that to us. So let's be clear about how generous he is. He knows that we're sinful, that we can't pay our bill. So he gives us his son and crucifies his son to pay our debt so that we can be bought back and have an entrance into the family of God. He's paid a huge amount, his very son, to buy us back. And he's given us his Holy Spirit to live inside us, to be a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance that someday we will see him face to face and we'll be guaranteed eternal pleasures at God's right hand forevermore. He's given us life and salvation and forgiveness and a future and an inheritance that will never spoil or fade. And he's given us money. Generously given us everything, and yet I'm like a toddler that says mine, especially when it comes to money. My money. My money. When I come to know Jesus, God brings me into his family. He's the king, and I'm the son. I'm the servant. He's the owner. I'm the servant. And I get to manage his resources so God's daughters and sons are entrusted not with my money, but with his kingdom money. It's his resources, not mine. And this is hard to get our minds around. This is a hard shift to realize, really, it's not my money? I earned it. I was given it. It's mine. No. If you're a son or daughter of the king, it's kingdom money. And maybe it's a good way to explain it by saying this. You know, there's a difference between renting and owning, right? So if you you own a car, that's different than if you rent a car. And how you treat the car you rent and how you treat the car you own is different, right? If you own a house, if you rent a house, it's different. You you see it differently. The, The ones that own get to do whatever the heck they want. So if you want to paint your bathroom fluorescent green, go ahead. But when you rent a place and you paint the bathroom fluorescent green, you know one day the owner's going to be like, what gives with my bathroom? When you rent a car and you spill your Frappuccino on the front seat, that's different than when you own a car and you spill your Frappuccino on the front seat. If you own it, you can spill it on the front seat all day long and pour tons of them. Let the kids throw Cheerios. Do whatever the heck you want. But when you rent a car and Cheerios are everywhere and the Frappuccino's all over the place, you know that the owner of the car is going to be like, Uh, what gives. If you have the mindset of own when you're a renter, how much does that change everything? You see, the God of the universe, as sons and daughters, says we're renters. He's, He's entrusted money to us, not as owners. We are managers, not owners of God's money. 
But that's a tough shift to make, isn't it? Because I see it as mine. He wants me to use my money for his purposes. And I know, okay, I know what you're thinking right now. You're like, I got to hold on to my wallet because the preacher's talking about money. You're elbowing the person next to you. Forget the password to your account so that he can't try to get money from you. You, you're, You're like, no, this is why I hate religion because I come into church and you just put your hands in my pocket and you take money from me. That's all you guys care about in organized religion. I know that's what you're thinking. But here's the deal. If the Bible teaches that we are owners of our money, then I want to teach that we are owners of our money. If the Bible teaches we're managers and renters, then I want to teach that we're managers and renters. Because if you think you're an owner, and one day the owner shows up and says, I need an account for what you did, then it's malpractice on my part not to teach you what the Bible says. The Bible teaches us that we do not own anything. That everything has been entrusted to us by our king. And if you act like you own when in reality you rent, you're a manager, a steward, then you will not be prepared to give an account to the king when he shows up. I mean, this is a cosmic shift. This is a major change for us in how we process life. I I get it. It's not unlike the moment when you realize you're a rebel, you're a sinner, and you can't fix it yourself. You can't do religion and get yourself out of your sin or your shame. When you come to realize that the only thing you can do when you know that you're broken and sinful is throw yourself on the mercy of God and ask Him to help, there's a cosmic shift that comes into play where you change your mindset and go, God, I, I can't solve my sin problem. You have to solve that for me. I need your help. I think this shift thinking, moving from I'm an owner of my money to I'm a manager of your money, God, is a major shift that only God can help us with. King Jesus came the first time to live and to die and to rise again, to pay the price of our sins and bring us into his kingdom, his family. And King Jesus will return a second time to establish his kingdom here on earth and make things all right and new so that we can live in happiness and peace with him forever. While we wait for his return, how we live matters. Do you see yourself as an owner? Or do you see yourself as a manager, a steward of the master's things? Do you see yourself as an owner or a manager? And I know for me this has been a journey. This is hard to see my money, my accounts, to see all that I have financially as I'm just a steward of these things, God. It's not mine, it's yours. That understanding has taken a long time and I'm not there yet. It's a process that can happen with God's help. And one resource that's helped me in this process is this little book called the treasure principle, and it's just full of practical application for how to see yourself as not an owner, but a manager of God's resources. And if if you sit here today and you're listening to this and you're processing this and going, I really want to shift my mind to think biblically about all that I own, and you honestly want to lean into that, I got you a copy of this book. It's available for you, one per household on your way out. If this would be a help to you, grab it. It'll take you an hour to read. It's really short, see? And the pages is big writing. So it won't take you long. (laughs) It won't take you long. But honestly, this has really helped me to shift my mindset to see myself not as an owner, but a manager of God's resources. And if it would be a help for you, please grab one of them on your way out. But if this morning all of this sounds completely nuts to you, and you're saying again, you're sitting here going, this is exactly why I hate church. How could you possibly get up there and say, it's not my money, it's God's? And the reason I can say it is because I've experienced some of the generosity of God. Maybe the reason that you're unable to see your money as God's is because you have yet to experience the generosity of God. 
The third servant who got one bag of gold hid his gold because he did not know the generosity of his master. Maybe that's what you're struggling with today too. So I have two bags of gold. I would like to give it away to some people here. Two bags of gold. I like to give this first bag of gold to someone who doesn't know me, that hasn't met me personally. Maybe today's your first day at Faith Church. If that's you, raise your hand. Come on. You want a bag of gold, don't you? This is your first day at Faith Church. There you go. Have some gold. I want to give this bag of gold away to someone I know who knows me, and you've been around the block around here for a while. Raise your hand. Anybody? Oh, my sister. Oh, hey, quit stealing from her. Okay. So, person that doesn't know me. Oh, um, just, I'm just kidding. It's not gold. It's chocolate. Um, person that doesn't know me. You know, you could take that bag of gold and you could hold on to it because, you know, you don't know me and you might think I put x lax in the chocolate. So you're not going to eat the chocolate. You don't know where it's been. You don't know what it's for and you don't know what I'm going to do with it. You might think he's going to ask for it back. I'm not sure. I'm just going to sit here and hold it. But you, my sister, you know me and you know that I certainly don't need any more calories. You know that I want you to take that bag and open it up and share it with everyone around you and eat it because you know me. If you know someone who gives you something, it changes how you act. But if you don't know the person that's giving you something, you act in fear. When you know the generosity of God, you manage the resources you have based on faith, not based on fear. And we will gather together as a church and we will say, oh, praise Jesus. Thank you for forgiving me of my sins, Jesus. We believe you have eternity for us, Jesus. And yet we operate out of fear and hold on tightly to our money. We say we have faith, but we act in fear, especially with our cash. And maybe, just maybe, the reason we act that way is because we don't yet fully know how generous God is. If we would understand the fullness and the generosity and the goodness of God, would we clamp down so hard on all our stuff? All the things that we have, all our relationships, would we control and have to own everything so tightly instead of going, no, you're a good father, God, that's given us generously all things. You've forgiven me for my sins. You promised me eternity forever. I don't need to clamp down. I can be open-handed. What would your life be like if you actually saw God as generous? If you actually understood His generosity? How would that change you? How would it change you if you knew for sure next Saturday at 12 noon Jesus is coming back? Would that change how you behave this week? Would that change how you act, how you live, what you do? The Bible says he could come back at any time. How would you change if you could shift your mindset away from I own everything to God, I'm your manager, I'm your steward? What would change? How would your life look differently? One day I'm going to take a dirt nap, so are you. You're going to stop breathing one day. You're going to cease to exist, and your personal kingdom will be over. And you will see your maker face to face. And when you see him face to face, don't you, like me, want to hear him say, well done? I just want to hear him say, well done, Joe. I, I entrusted things to you. You didn't get it perfectly. You botched it more than you got it right. But you saw yourself as a manager, a steward, not as an owner, not as a holder on to everything. You represented my family well. Well done, Joe. Isn't that what you want to? And it's a journey of shifting our minds and saying, God, change my heart. I am your son, your daughter. Everything you've entrusted to me is for your purposes, not mine. Help me with open hands to use all that you've given me to advance your kingdom, not mine. Would you pray with me? Incredibly generous and kind to grant us life. 
and hope and peace all comes from you. These things are good gifts from you, Father. So help us grow our faith in you. Forgive us for our anxiety and our fear. Forgive us for our selfishness. Forgive us for our entitlement complex that we act like spoiled babies. Forgive us for not knowing that you want to share more with us, but we're happy with less. Please, God, change our minds, renew our minds. Cause us to see greater visions of your kindness and your generosity and your sovereignty and your control. Cause us to open our hands and see ourselves as your managers, not as owners. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen.